All right, welcome to the first ILM in measurement, uh, accuracy and repeatability. Um, nice, good start to the third year program here, um, discussing some relatively simple concepts. The rationale behind this ILM here, uh, dealing with accuracy and repeatability, um, the terms themselves specify the performance of measurement instruments. And for us as instrument technicians, it's important to understand which factors are used to determine the accuracy and repeatability of an instrument so that we can know which questions to ask when we are selecting an instrument. So it's one of the specifications that are generally required when we're, when we're sourcing a measuring device is, is how accurate it is. Um, so good for us to understand how all of that is uh, qualified and quantified. In this outcome, or the outcomes from this ILM here, we will be able to calculate the accuracy of a measurement system. Uh, once we're all done, I will start out by describing what accuracy is, what repeatability is, uh, stating accuracy for analog and digital instruments and calculating ranges of errors based on accuracy statements. We'll describe the, the relationship between accuracy and repeatability because although they are uh, similar and definitely related, they are slightly different. And then uh, the last objective deals with measuring and calculating the possible and probable range of errors for a measurement system, uh, which consists of several uh, instruments. Every loop that we deal with uh, has several different instruments in it, from a transmitter to a, to a valve, uh, and, and the processor and, and all of these devices have potentials uh, to introduce error. So we want to understand how they all work together as a system and how we can calculate the accuracy of that system. Ooh, good sound effect. Okay, so what is accuracy on page one? By definition, accuracy is defined as the closeness with which the output of a device represents the true value of the input to that device. So if it's a pressure transmitter and I'm uh, feeding at 100 PSI, uh, is the transmitter reading 100 PSI or is it reading 99.9 PSI? Um, throughout the PowerPoints, uh, you'll see some text that is in orange that generally is directed towards uh, the self-test sections at the back. So as you uh, go through the ILM, you might want to highlight things that you see in orange because they, they reference self-test stuff and will make it easier for you to find the reference material as uh, you go through the self-test at the end of the ILM. Okay, for example here, the output of a pressure gauge is the indication which is read from the faceplate or the pointer. The input to the gauge is the applied pressure. Uh, therefore, the accuracy of this pressure gauge is the closeness that the dial indication matches the actual applied pressure. So whether it's a pressure transmitter or, or a, a gauge, pressure gauge, flow gauge, it doesn't matter what type of instrument, but if we're applying something to it, we're expecting to be able to read something uh, that represents the same value. Okay, often accuracy is expressed in percent of span or sometimes in percent of indication. Uh, we'll see in the next couple of slides that there are many different ways for uh, quantifying and qualifying accuracy. So span and indication are just a couple of them. So for accuracy, uh, the statement is all uh, centering around error. So if everything is perfect, then we have 100% accuracy and everything is good. But when we're not accurate, it's obviously due to some type of error. And that difference between what we've applied, whether it's bottled, uh, bottled air or a temperature reference or uh, a chemical reference, and what we actually see is called error. So we'll go on to describe two types of errors. Uh, the first type is called a systematic error or a bias error. And the second type that we're going to talk about is called a random error or a precision error. And we'll look at the specific qualities of each of these two types of errors. Uh, one of them uh, is inherent and we can deal with it through calibration. And the other one uh, is kind of unexplained. Uh, and the names kind of reflect that. So looking at this graph that we have up here, uh, looking at a target here, it kind of throws all of these different terms uh, that we've looked at here into uh, a relative perspective. So if, we'll, if we see in our little uh, grouping of, of shots here, 
you'll see that they're consistently inaccurate. And that means that there's a certain amount of error that's associated with every individual reading. It's present in every single one of these. It's not, not any one of them is on the target. So they're all out by some certain amount. And that amount is called the bias error. So it's off by a bias. It's like having a preload on a, uh, a regulator or something like that. It's a bias pressure, just like it's a bias error. So that, that known amount from center that we get here is, is called a bias. The individual errors between the individual shots at this point here represent the random errors. We're not sure why these are, you know, a little bit out from each other. Uh, it's just the way the thing is. We can't do much about it. Uh, repeat, repeatability is how each of these individual measurements relate to each other. So the tighter the group is, the better the repeatability. The closer to the bullseye, the better the overall accuracy. So lots of different things mentioned in that particular slide. Mm. Okay, so um, some definitions here on those two terms here. The cause of random error is not known, hence the name random. They just follow the law of chance. So it's just you're out a little bit, things aren't perfect. The cause of bias error, however, can be found. It affects all measurements equally. Uh, examples include zero offset error, uh, things that are derived from cell deterioration. So as equipment gets older, we have uh, circumstances called drift uh, in a sensor, for example, that we'll address later. So uh, that can be one of these types of cell deterioration. It can also be a battery uh, or a power supply type de deterioration that causes a, a drift uh, in measurements. Uh, dead band, orifice wear, all of these things are uh, contributing to bias errors. We can find out what they are uh, through some type of, of measurement. Some of them are variable, that is that they'll change slightly over time, such as an orifice wearing out or a cell deteriorating. Uh, some of them are constant. Uh, down and dirty about the difference between random errors and, and systematic or biased errors. Random errors we can't do much about. Bias errors can be calibrated out. Okay, when we talk about accuracy, we quantify them in, in, a, in something called an accuracy statement. Um, we automatically assume that no device is 100% accurate, thereby we then must have some uh, method of stating how inaccurate it is, and this is done uh, by stating the range of errors that are associated with a particular device. So it is a plus minus value of some sort uh, in, and in some type of a unit generally. Um, we call that an accuracy rating. So for a thermometer, uh, it may be accurate to plus or minus two degrees. And we'll get into some further qualifications of that as well. Uh, two degrees uh, of the reading or two degrees of span or things like that. So accuracy statements give it some type of a value and some type of a range. Accuracy is important. Sometimes it's more important than other times. Um, page four talked a little bit about uh, different circumstances and, and the varying degrees that accuracy is important. Uh, for example, custody transfer, uh, it's very important that we're accurate. Goods are being exchanged for money. It's uh, when we're going for gas, we're paying $1.55 a liter for, for gasoline we want to be pretty darn sure that we're getting that liter of gasoline. If we're not getting that liter of gasoline, of course, people are going to be stomping their feet uh, and there's going to be problems. So very important in custody transfer. Uh, resource and pollution monitoring uh, becoming more and more popular uh, nowadays that we're counting our carbon and our CO2 and all of this. So a situation like this also um, very important in terms of, of accuracy. We need to know uh, the quantities of resources that are being removed from Alberta. Uh, we get tax revenue from that, so that's pretty important. Uh, we also have to be aware of how much pollution that we're emitting because, hey, well, never would I thought I would say this, but that's also a taxable item nowadays. So uh, you're paying money for things. You want to make sure that the measurements are pretty accurate. But there are situations when um, accuracy is not as important as those situations. And I believe it's coming up in a couple of slides. We'll talk about situations where uh, being repeatable 
uh, is a little bit more than being accurate. So that leads us into repeatability here on page five. Uh, looking at the two diagrams here, we see that our, our accuracy is not incredibly good, assuming that we're aiming for the bullseye, but our repeatability is, is pretty good. And I don't know if you're uh, anybody out there is a hunter or not a hunter. Um, ideally, of course, you know, you want to, you want to hit the bullseye or the, or the target when you're, when you're out there hunting. Um, but if you take five shots or six shots as we have here, and you know that every time you shoot, you're going to be uh, two inches to the right and six inches high, you can deal with that, right? So repeatability is something that can be worked with um, if accuracy alone is not that important. So again, here, the looking at a diagram here, repeatability uh, is the full range, uh, either side of center or the plus or minus value. And we look at it in a horizontal uh, or sorry, in a vertical axis here up and down, but it's also this way if we're looking at a circle. And accuracy is that smaller uh, number that is how far are we from center or being exactly perfect. Okay, so by definition, we have repeatability is the closeness, and some of these definitions are uh, rather wordy, uh, is the closeness of an agreement among a number of consecutive measurements of the output for the same value of the input under the same operating conditions approaching from the same direction. Long story short, that's saying that when we are testing a pressure transmitter, for example, we start out at zero, we pump it up, pump it up to 50 PSI, we're pumping it up every time we do that we're getting a measurement and that value is repeatability if we pump it past 50 psi and we bring it from 100 down to 50 psi that doesn't count that is something called hysteresis uh, and we'll talk about hysteresis later but hysteresis basically is the same thing except it's taking to uh, taking into account the physical characteristics of a device that are inherently built into it. Nothing is built 100% perfect. Uh, very few devices can go from zero uh, to full range and back down to zero in a perfectly linear fashion. Uh, and that's why we define the difference between hysteresis and repeatability. So repeatability is going one way a number of different times. Uh, this is related to reproducibility, uh, which is similar but different in that it approaches from both directions. So reproducibility and hysteresis are tied together, whereas repeatability is a little bit more simplified. Okay, it addresses, it addresses that factor that may not be the same in different directions. So some of us or, or some of you may have had that experience with a, a pressure switch or a temperature switch, for example. Uh, you know, you want this switch to, it's a high temperature switch, for example, and you want it to trip at 50 degrees Celsius. And then there's a, you know, a dead head in there of two or three degrees sometimes. So yeah, temperature goes up, it hits 50, uh, the switch trips, the temperature goes up to 60 and then starts coming back down again. Well, ideally you want that switch to come back in at 50, but it might come in at 52. It might come in at 49 something like that so being able to have consistent reactions uh, is kind of the goal of, of a control system so uh, easier to get repeatability than it is to get reproducibility is the long story here okay when we go up and down and we do our measurements or we're testing a device um, we end up creating of course some data uh, this data is recorded in something called an error graph. And here we have a, an error graph from the ILM here with a bunch of plots that we have taken as, uh, as uh, values against the reading and how we interpret the, the data here on the chart. So from this error graph, we can determine a bunch of different things. Uh, the first one is average error. So we've taken a bunch of these measurements here uh, ranging from uh, minus 0.5 to plus 0.7. If we took all of these errors and we added them all up and then divided them by the number of uh, data points here, uh, we get our systematic error. So in this case here, uh, it's going to be 0.1%. So it's going to be uh, 0.7 plus 0.6 plus 0.5 plus 0.4 plus 0.3 plus 0.2 plus 0.1. 
plus zero and then minus 0.1, minus 0.2, minus 0.3, minus 0.4, minus 0.5. We add all those up together and then we divide by however many data points there are there, 12 or 13, I'm not counting them. We'll get, a, we'll get an average number, which is 0.1. That is our systematic error. Then we can also find repeatability. Uh, repeatability here, as we see between the lines, is simply the range of errors. So in this case, from minus 0.5 to plus 0.7 uh, gives us a range of 1.2. And then the last piece of data uh, that we can collect from here is the random error, uh, which simply is half of the repeatability, or in this case, half of 1.2, uh, which is 0.6. If we were to uh, state the accuracy for this particular device that we've taken the, the uh, measurements, it is a combination of the systematic error here, this 0.1%, and the random error here, which is 0.6%. We combine them together, and we can say that the accuracy for this particular instrument is plus or minus 0.7%. So it's statistics. We don't have to get into it too heavily. Um, this, this isn't uh, as bad as it used to be. Uh, we used to have to do all kinds of standard deviation calculations uh, and things like that. So this uh, is just some relatively uh, simple explanation of how, how we interpret that data in terms of the definitions that we've already discussed. <clears throat> okay, so getting back to that accuracy versus repeatability that we mentioned earlier here, uh, this reflects page eight in the ILM, uh, and you'll see I've got C page eight, and it talks about this uh, product mixing station. Uh, and I can summarize that page here by saying, in process control, there's a time for accuracy and a time for repeatability. Uh, an example here is mixing concrete. Repeatability is probably more important than accuracy. And when mixing pharmaceuticals, accuracy is probably more important than repeatability. Um, very general, broad statements, uh, but the ILM basically says the same thing. Like, even though, uh, you know, maybe we're supposed to be putting uh, 50 liters a minute into each of these uh, feeds so that we get our, our product out of the proper ratio, uh, if they're 60 liters a minute each, we're still going to get the product ratio that we want. Um, so the accuracy isn't necessarily there, but the repeatability kind of is. So uh, kind of long drawn out relation between uh, accuracy and repeatability. It's really as simple as sometimes accuracy is better, sometimes repeatability is better. So talking about accuracy statements, we have this plus and minus range uh, that we assign to a device. Uh, so uh, can go a little bit farther with that and state it uh, in terms um, as such as uh, uh, plus or minus the married, uh, not married, measured variable, uh, plus or minus or percentage of span or percentage of the range or percentage of the reading. So uh, we'll look at some examples of uh, accuracy statements that are uh, expressed uh, in some of these different ways here. And you'll see, you'll see many different ways of stating it. Uh, through different vendors and different specifications. Um, but the long story short is generally to make them most understandable, uh, you want to get them into a percent of reading. It's a lot easier for us to understand uh, plus or minus one degree or plus or minus one PSI than it is to say, you know, plus or minus 1% of 500 KPA. We want to make things uh, as simple as possible uh, for understanding purposes. So this little box basically says the same thing here, stating inaccuracy in terms of the measured variable gives us the best feel of how accurate a measurement it is. Um, as well, when we're comparing different accuracy statements, uh, we gotta we got to compare them in the same terms, right? Variables to variables, spans to spans, apples to apples, orange to oranges. So as a result, generally speaking, the first three ways of stating accuracy are normally converted to the fourth, and we'll see that in the next few slides here. Okay, so the first one was percent of span. Uh, relatively simple formulas for calculating the accuracies here. The, the math is not very complicated. Uh, formulas follow basically the same 
format, just different uh, words stuck in here. So to find the percent of span, uh, it's simply the stated percent of span over the 100% span times the span value will end up giving us a plus or minus uh, for that device. So a temperature transmitter, for example, that has a range of minus 50 to 250 degrees Celsius has a span of 300 degrees. The accuracy is stated as 0.1% of span. So let's see what that looks like. We go 0.1 over 100% times our span, gives us a value of plus or minus 0.3 degrees Celsius. So if I had a 300 degree span here and I said it was 1% of span, the math you can do in your head, right? 1% of 300 is three, right? So plus or minus three degrees, 0.1. 0.3 degrees. So not very complicated math. Uh, next example here, uh, just uh, highlighting the fact that a smaller span, of course, is going to make a smaller error. Uh, take a transmitter with a range of minus 50 to 150 or 100 degree span with the same accuracy statement of 0.1%. Apply that to the formula and you'll see that we get plus or minus 0.1 degree Celsius in terms of span. Next, we'll look at percent of range. Uh, similar to span, but different. Um, same type of a formula here, a pressure transmitter with a range of zero to 500 kPa, it has a range of course of 500 kPa. Accuracy is stated as 1% of upper range value. Upper range value in this case is 500 kPa, so 1% of 500 is five. Pretty straightforward, you can almost do this in your head. Um, but the formula, again, 1% for your accuracy statement of the upper range value, which in this case, 500 kPa. And there we go. And notice engineering units because they're nice and easy to understand. Okay, last one here is percent of reading. Uh, this one is a little bit, uh, this one's a little bit different, but not too badly here. Uh, we have a flow transmitter with the range of zero meters cubed per hour to 59.4 meters cubed per hour. So this is a range of 59.4 uh, cubes per hour. Um, the accuracy is stated as 0.65% of rate. So throwing all kinds of different terms um, at you here, but for, uh, the math is all very standard. Uh, and in this case, percent of reading. So here we have the reading of 42.5 meters cubed per hour. So we'll use our accuracy statement in our formula of 0.65 over 100%, which is standard times, of course, our reading, because that's what we're stating it in here at 42.5. So this, uh, that, that this particular reading, our accuracy is plus or minus 0.3 meters cubed per hour. So as you see, uh, different terms in, in uh, stating the accuracy, but the same um, basic math to find those values. Some devices are more accurate in certain parts of their operating range. Thus, they will provide you with multiple accuracy statements. Uh, multimeters are uh, good examples of this. They'll have an accuracy statement for voltage. Uh, there'll be an accuracy statement for amps. There'll be an accuracy statement for milliamps, um, different uh, different devices can have multiple accurate accuracy statements here. So um, I think third year, uh, second year, first year, you probably have learned already that most devices um, generally have better accuracy in the middle and upper end of their range than they do at the bottom. Um, that, that's something to keep in mind. It is, it is a fact. Um, if you haven't uh, learned it yet, um, one of the first things I learned is, you know, when you're specking out a, a pressure gauge, for example, and you know that the process is going to be um, operating at 100 PSI, you're not going to go out and buy uh, 100 PSI gauge usually because if you go over range, it's, it's going to be over range. So you, you buy a gauge that's 200 PSI so that you're, you're operating in the middle of that range. Um, it's more accurate in the middle of that range. You're not going to buy a thousand psi gauge because then it's only going to be reading in the first 10 percent of its range and most devices are not as accurate in the first 
probably 20 to 25 percent of their range as they are in the 25 to 50 and even usually much more accurate at the upper end of their range. Um, so that's why sometimes you'll get multiple accuracy statements. Um, some statements will state a minimum or fixed possible range of errors along with another accuracy statement. So for example, a temperature transmitter with a 0.1% of span and a minimum of 0.2%. So two different statements here. How do you know which one to use? It's always the, the greater of the two. So the worst number is the number that you call your accuracy, right? You're only as good as your weakest link. This now will lead us into another new term uh, called rangeability. Uh, and there's some math for rangeability that we'll look at here as well. Uh, rangeability is a relationship between the maximum range of a device and the minimum value that you can accurately measure with that device. It is very common with flow measurement, um, not as common in other uh, devices, but all devices, uh, especially modern electronic devices, uh, have turned down ratios and actually very good turn down ratios uh, compared to uh, older devices. Okay, so what does is, what is rangeability look like in real life here? Uh, flow transmitter has an accuracy stated of plus or minus 2% of the rate with a turn down of 10 to one. So basically what this is telling us is that this transmitter is good for measuring plus or minus 2% down to a tenth basically of its overall range. So let's let's give that some real numbers so that you can wrap your brains around this a little easier. The range of the transmitter is zero, uh, zero to 60 meters cubed. That's what the, the cell itself is uh, capable of measuring. Uh, turn down ratio of 10 to one is that it can accurately measure, and I'm cutting ahead here a little bit. I'll show you the math in a second. It can accurately measure flows that are one-tenth of its overall range. So in this case here, one-tenth of 60 meters would be six meters. Uh, to, do the, to do the math, uh, to convert turn down ratio based on the range, simple formula here, uh, URV over the minimum lower range value is equal to the turn down ratio. And then we extrapolate it to get the answer in this, in this case here, flip-flop, whatever you gotta do to get uh, the formula spun around here. Uh, we take our upper range value or our maximum range here, 60 meters cubed, divide it by our turn, turn down ratio, which is 10 divided by uh, one or 0.1, uh, or sorry, or 10 over one, which is 10, uh, which gives us six meters cubed per hour. So what we're saying here is that this device is equally accurate at 60 meters as it is at six meters based on this turn down ratio. That might have been a little bit more complicated of an explanation than uh, was necessary. So that was uh, addressing basically uh, instruments and devices that we that we uh, assign accuracy statements and, and numbers and uh, units to. Uh, this next little section starting on page 14 here gets into digital accuracy ratings. And this is more specific to uh, our meters and the things that we use uh, when we're calibrating field devices. Um, the field devices that uh, we're out there servicing and maintaining have accuracy statements when they're uh, designed and they're in the specifications for those devices. Um, the digital meters that we use uh, also have accuracy statements. We send them away every year to be certified. Uh, they're certified to these specifications uh, and ratings. So digital accuracy ratings are not really fundamentally different than uh, what we looked at already, but uh, we get into some particulars uh, talking about digital meters and how that is uh, accomplished. The definition of digital accuracy, uh, the maximum positive or negative deviation from a known value, uh, usually expressed in the terms of measured variable or percent of measurement, so nothing really new and exciting there. Uh, digital accuracy 
is expressed in terms of a percent of reading and the number of digits times the resolution. And hang on, this is uh, not as bad as it sounds. Okay, so I'll just get everything up here. So the indicated error is a function of the percent accuracy of the device times the digital reading plus the number of digits accuracy. This is a specification uh, of the meter. If we looked in the back of a, a fluke uh, manual, for example, you would find the number of digits accuracy in there as a specification based on uh, what you were measuring, volts, amps, milliamps, etc. You would also find the value in the specifications for the meter uh, dealing with resolution. So uh, this is what's showing up on the display of the meter. These values here are specifications that will come out of the manual for the device. So for example, it would look something something like this. It's got an accuracy statement that says I'm plus or minus uh, 2%. 0.2%. My reading, what I'm looking at on my meter is reading 94.8, the specifications I get out of the back of the flute. And you're not going to have to look into the back of a manual for any of this stuff. You'll be provided with a question that uh, gives you all this information. Uh, two digits times the resolution given in, in this application, which in this case is 0.1. And this is kind of what it looks like. Maybe I shouldn't have put this on the slide right here because uh, the next slide walks it through the whole thing. Um, but this is the exercise that we're about to perform in order to determine the digital accuracy of a reading that we see on a meter. Oh, look at that, high tech. Almost right. Okay, so here's what a, a common example in terms of uh, this course would look like. Determine the range of errors in terms of the measured variable, and it's almost always going to be the measured variable, for the following measurement. Okay, the accuracy, and again from specifications for this device, is plus or minus 0.02% plus 2. This is the number of digits. Okay, this is the um, accuracy statement. The range is two volts so a lot of this is easier to wrap your head around if you picture yourself looking at your meter uh, it's not something that we consciously think about but when you turn on your meter it displays numbers in a certain way right if we're measuring one volt for example and you've got a, a screen that has uh, four positions uh, for an LCD, such as we have in this example a digital meter with a four digit display and um, we are measuring 25 volts, the screen is going gonna, is gonna to show 25.00 volts, right? It's, it's not something that we think about consciously, but that, that's what happens generally. Okay, so anyway, uh, resolution here uh, is, is stated at 0 0.001 volts to 1 volts, uh, and the reason that we're uh, expressing this in a range is because most meters nowadays are auto ranging. So it will select the range for you based on the value, right? It's not going to have, uh, you've got four spaces, so it's not going to measure 25.0. You've got the extra spot there. It's not going to be 0 025.0. It's going to be relatively logical. So try not to overcomplicate it. So take the values given from the question here. So our accuracy is 0.02% over 100 times what we're measuring or what the screen is displaying as we measure. So we're measuring 25 volts. It displays uh, 25 volts uh, to two decimal places, right? So we get two digits. That's just a number. It, it's given in the question. There's no calculation there. The resolution in this case, because it's variable in the question, 0 0.001 to 1 volt, we're relying on an auto-ranging meter here. And again, you auto-range it. Think about what it's going to read. Two decimal places, two decimal places. So that's the resolution. If, if you can't figure it out any other way, the resolution is going to be the same as what you see on the meter. Okay, so don't be confused by by this. Okay, so again, 
all of these values get plunked into there. We do the math and we say that our error at 25 volts is plus or minus 0 0.07 volts. Long and drawn out, but that's the way it goes. Okay, that's a four digit display. You're wondering why am I telling you about a four digit display? Because we confuse it next with a four and a half digit display in a second here. Okay, so uh, to show you the difference, uh, the previous example, we were looking at 25 volts and a four digit display. Here, we're gonna look at 120 volts and a four digit display. So again, you turn your meter, increase your range uh, to probably 200 volt range, you click, click, click. And what's the display gonna show? It's gonna show something like 120.0, right? One decimal place, one decimal place resolution. Accuracy statement for that meter is still the same. So 0.02% times our reading, in this case, 120 volts, times the number of digits, which again, isn't gonna change, it's a specification, times the resolution, which in this case uh, ties in with the auto ranging and gives us that one decimal place, one decimal place. So we'll run out the math here, and at 120 volts, we're plus or minus 0.44 volts. So we'll see, not as accurate uh, up there as we are uh, as we are down here. Feel free to yell at me if I'm uh, trucking along a little bit too fast. Okay, this example here is uh, no different than the previous two examples, except we're introducing uh, a meter called a uh, four and a half digit display meter. Um, there's a lot of talk right now within the provincial apprenticeship committees uh, to kind of wipe this, kind of wipe this whole section out actually, um, because most meters nowadays are completely automatic, auto ranging and all this stuff happens. Uh, by itself, um, but I still think it's kind of a little bit interesting. So basically the same. Uh, the only difference with the next two calculations that we're going to look at here is we're dealing with something called a four and a half digit display. And that's kind of a little bit of a brain buster. Um, but what this half digit really means is that the first position here, this is the half digit position, and it can only be a zero or a one okay don't try to think any more about it than that just know that if you're dealing with a half digit display that just means that the, from the first value could be a zero or a one it can't be a two three four five six seven any of those it has to be a zero or a one but it does give us more resolution okay that's what it comes down to it gives us one more spot of resolution Okay, so in this case, we're measuring uh, two cells. The first one we're gonna do here is one and a half volts. The next slide will deal with this uh, 0.85 volt cell and you'll see how this uh, relates to uh, this four and a half digit display. So again, values from specifications here, uh, plus or minus 0.04% plus two digits. Uh, the range is two volts, doesn't really matter. Uh, resolution in this case, uh, 0.0001 so on and so forth. So plunking uh, stuff into the formula, accuracy 0 0.04, the reading 1.5 volts, number of digits two, the resolution four spaces, four spaces because this is what our meter would show, gives us plus or minus 0 0.0008 volts. Rocket science. Same math here, except we're measuring 0.85 volt cell. So same number. 0.85 volts is our measured uh, or display value. Um, and you'll see here, again, closing your eyes and imagining what you would see on the screen. If you had five, uh, five LCD squares, that would mean it is technically called a four and a half digit display. The first spot, either a one or a zero, in this case, it's a zero, uh, giving us this resolution still four decimal places run out the math, plus or minus 0 0.00054. That is digital accuracy uh, explained. Not very exciting, but uh, something that we should understand. Okay, testing accuracy. Um, probably one of the first jobs that you get if you go into construction, or at least it was the first job I got, 
uh, when I got into construction way back in the day, sit you down in a sea can and say, uh, that shelf over there has 200 uh, pressure gauges on it. I want you to do a calibration check on all of them. So here you go, apprentice, there's a dead weight tester. Have a good day. Uh, so you start with them and you run them up and you run them down and you record as found, as left, et cetera. Uh, this is testing accuracy. When we collect our values, uh, zero to 100 and coming back down, we record these values uh, and you'll see the difference between calibrator reading and the actual device reading it is of course our error and we record it in a positive or negative way depending on which way it goes here so uh, either positive or, or negative and we use the largest number out of all of them again largest or worst number 0.5 is the greatest error here so we use that accuracy statement for the reading statement Okay, we mentioned earlier that devices uh, tend to be more accurate in the higher portion of their operating range than they are in the lower portion of the operation range. Uh, this can be visually represented here in what's called a accuracy envelope. And the accuracy envelope is designed specifically to express where the device is most accurate in terms of its range. So this ties in with rangeability, uh, as we'll see in the next slide here. Um, but typically what you'll see here, um, in the bottom 10% of a digital device, pretty inaccurate, but the remaining 90% is pretty good. And certainly the top 30% is very, very good. Analog, uh, again, not really awesome at all until you get to about 50%. Above 50% accuracy is pretty good and it continues to improve. So generally speaking, we want to be measuring in the middle to upper range uh, portions of, of our uh, range of a device, right? So if we have a uh, pressure gauge, for example, we want to we be uh, 100 PSI out of a 200 PSI gauge so that we start getting good accuracy. If it's a 1,000 PSI gauge, well, none of this is None of this is any good if we're trying to measure 100 psi on a on a thousand psi gauge. Well, it's you can't really count on it, right? So that's what this accuracy envelope uh, expresses here. So it's got some math attached to it. So let's see what that looks like. Wow. Okay. Here's all kinds of wonderful uh, things that we uh, we can we can look at here. So range in this case zero to 100 percent. Accuracy is expressed at plus or minus 0.5% of full scale. Okay, so 0.5% of full scale. Performance limit is plus or minus 4% of reading. This is what we can tolerate in terms of performance. Question will say, to determine the range of errors, the accuracy curve and the rangeability. And I, you guys don't have to Google. Uh, there is an example of this, I believe, in the self-test uh, portion of the ILM but this isn't uh, something that you'll generally do in practice. So let's look how to do it, just in case uh, someday you ever have to refer back to the uh, ILM here. So range of error, simply the percentage of full scale over 100% times the range, which will give us our plus minus value here. So again, accuracy stated at plus or minus 0.5%, so 0.5% over 100 times our range, in this case, 100% gives us plus or minus 0.5. Rangeability is not much more difficult here. It is the error multiplied by the 100% over the percent of reading. So plunking in our numbers here, our, our uh, range of errors here, plus or minus 0.5 times 100% over what is our percent of reading that we're uh, allowing. In this case, it's 4% do that math and you say 12% or sorry, 12 and a half percent is the lowest part of our range that we can operate in before getting below that 4% tolerance, right? So that's represented here. Anything less than 12 and a half percent, the accuracy is worse than our minimum performance value. So we don't want to go in there. 
So that leads us then to rangeability. How accurate is this device throughout its overall range in terms of what we are willing to accept? That will define our turndown ratio. In this case, full span of 100%, the lower range value or the minimum reading at which we stay within our tolerance of 4% is at 12.5. Divide the two together, and that gives us a rangeability of eight to one. And yeah, that's a that's a brain full of math. I'm imagining for first day of class, um, but it's uh, easy math considering uh, what's coming in the future. Okay, <clears throat> repeatability and accuracy and the relationship between the two of them. And this is my probably my favorite slide in the entire third year package. So good accuracy, good repeatability, poor accuracy, good repeatability, and poor accuracy and poor repeatability. And this is what we're striving for. Ideally, excellent accuracy, excellent repeatability. If that's going for the kill shot he's not happy you're very happy uh, good accuracy he uh, sorry poor accuracy but good repeatability means if I'm aiming for the forehead but I'm shooting him in the cheek my accuracy is poor but my grouping or repeatability is good and the harsh reality of me um, poor accuracy and poor repeatability. So that's the relationship between accuracy and repeatability in a nutshell. Ideal, less than ideal, manageable. Perfect. This leads us now to objective four, five. This is objective five. So we're near the end here. Uh, system accuracy. So pulling it all together. Um, a system is comprised of all of its components. The effect of the individual errors of these components bears on the system's accuracy rating. So the accuracy of a system, again, is comprised of the accuracy ratings of all the individual components within that system. Um, calculating this can be complicated, uh, but we are going to limit ourselves to two basic methods to determine a general overall accuracy statement for a system. They are defined as the possible and probable error calculations. And this is a nice way to wind down this ILM. Okay, so system accuracy again divided into possible system error, which is defined as uh, simply the addition of all the error sources together. And we'll look at an example in the next slide. Probable system error is the square root of the sum of all the error sources squared. A little bit complicated to read, uh, but we'll show you what that looks like in the next slide here. Probable error is always smallable, smallable, haha, uh -huh, smaller than the possible error, right? Um, what could possibly go wrong and what actually may go wrong? Possibly all kinds of things could go wrong but it's likely that only one thing will go wrong. So keep that in your mind there, that probable error is always small, smaller than possible. Getting my nerds wixed a lot here today. Okay, so error of the system in terms of possible error is the error contributed by device one plus device two plus device three plus device four, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera simply the sum of the error of all the different devices. Probable error, the square root of the sum of each of the individual errors squared. So a little bit different, square, 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 and then a square root of all of that. So we'll look at these two numbers. You'll see uh, that this number is going to be much larger than this number in the uh, next example. Okay, here we have uh, an example where we have a meter, uh, thermocouple, an ice bath, 
and the thermocouple table. So all of these components uh, have some inherent error value attached to them. Um, our ice water bath has a plus and minus of some number of degrees. Uh, our thermocouple has a plus minus value of some number of degrees. Our multimeter has a plus or minus value of some numbers uh, of degrees. So the question will be determine the possible and probable system error in measuring a temperature using a thermocouple, ice bath, and a voltmeter. So combined, this would be our system. Each of these components contributes to the error in that system as they are stated here. So the term of thermocouple uh, tables say plus or minus 0.5% of reading, the ice bath 0.1% plus or minus of reading, and the voltmeter plus or minus 0.2% of reading. So to find the possible system error, we sum up these values. So 0.5% plus 0.1% plus 0.2% gives us 0.8% plus or minus for possible error for this system. The probable system error based on the same values, 0.5%, 0.1%, 0.2%, this time squared, squared, and squared. And then you take the square root of all of those, gives us 0.548%. So you can see a smaller number. What will actually happen is probably not what could happen, right? You could get packed up for your holidays and you think, okay, I'm going on holidays. What could happen? I need to pack antihistamines and Tylenols for my hangovers and two pairs of flip flops in case I break one and uh, uh, some, uh, some Imodium just in case. All of these things could happen, but what's likely to happen, you're, hopefully you're just gonna get a hangover and you only need one of those things. That is the end of first IOM of third year, uh, accuracy and repeatability. So I hope that wasn't too painful for you. Turn off recording here if I get a chance.